I'm Margie Gillis. I'm the president of Literacy How and a research affiliate at Haskins Laboratories. And in both roles, I've been working with teachers doing professional development on the application of reading research, taking the most current reading research methods on how children learn to read, what the best interventions and classroom instructional practices are, so that we know that it's based on evidence and we mentor teachers in their classrooms so that they can learn how to apply those strategies and those methods with their own students. Dyslexia is misunderstood in schools, I think, for a variety of reasons. I think there's still a lack of awareness about what it is and maybe a lack of consensus about what it is. Um, there's a Roper poll that's been conducted, um, I think, every 10 years, and while a, and it looks at the general public's awareness of different issues. And while it's improved in terms of what people understand about dyslexia and learning disabilities, there's still a lot of misconception. So there's still a lot of people that think dyslexia means you see things backwards. Um, it's all about reversing letters and numbers, so it's a visual perceptual problem. So there's a lack of understanding, even though the research has been around for at least 40 years. And it's also a, a, a budgetary issue, because if you identify dyslexia and, it, we, and we hold schools accountable for working with dyslexics using a specific methodology, it means that they have to spend money training people to use the specific evidence-based practices, and that's, that's costly. So even though it's more costly to you know, solve the problem later, and we all know that, it costs the, the country billions and trillions of dollars in so many respects, but it's really, I think, first a lack of awareness and second a, a budgetary issue. A child with dyslexia needs, from, a, from an educational point of view, um, needs a great teacher, needs the most skilled teacher, um, needs a teacher that has empathy because a child with dyslexia has to work really, really hard to learn the academic skills that are so essential for success in school. Um, so empathy, but also a great deal of knowledge because as Louisa Mote said, teaching reading is rocket science. It's not easy to teach, especially struggling readers, to read. You have to have a great deal of knowledge about the language, foundations of reading and you have to know the research, know what works for which children in what um, amounts or dosages. So teachers have to be incredibly skilled. Um, they have to be willing to try lots of things because one size doesn't fit all even with dyslexic children. Um, equally important, a teacher has to find the dyslexic child's strengths and talents because if they're working really, really hard all day long to learn the academic skills, they have to be able to have time to you know, enjoy school. So they have to find their talents and they all have great talents. Um, that can be challenging because there's only so many hours in the day, there are so many resources schools have available, and unfortunately a lot of the programs that ch dyslexic children shine in um, have been cut from schools. Um, so I think teachers are obviously very important, equally important are parents. Um, a dyslexic child has to have a parent who is willing um, and has the resources to find what that child needs, whether it's the right tutor, the right school, um, the right um, programs, um, enrichment programs, so they can find their talents and nurture their talents. So whether it's um, athletic talents or musical abilities, artistic abilities, I think the parent has to really be willing to go the extra mile and find that, but they also have to have the resources to do it. So parents from poverty don't necessarily have access to the same resources that parents from more affluent situations have access to. 
Um, so parent, you know, parent advocacy is really important. Also having even a greater um, network for the child beyond the parent because these children burn their parents out and not for any reason other than the fact that they they struggle. So having a grandparent that understands them or some other advocate in their life that, that the parent, when they get tired, they can say, you know, Grandma, can you have take you know my son for the for the night or the weekend or what have you? Um, so I think having an extended community for that child is very very important. And then ultimately, as a child becomes more aware of his or her um, strengths and weaknesses, having a community for for that child to be, become part of, so that they feel like they belong and they don't feel singled out or isolated. The advice that parents need um, so that they can be the best advocate for their child in a school without feeling that they're going to get some backlash from the administrators or from the teachers because they're being that squeaky wheel that's saying, my child needs this, that, and the other thing. I think that the best advice I can give is that you walk into any room or classroom or, or discussion about your child and start the conversation by saying, you know, I'm here because my child is the most important person in my life and you're probably parents too, so you know how important it is that we, you know, all do what's right on behalf of this child, just like we would want to do the same for your child. And to just assume that that's, that's everyone's kind of philosophy there. So get it right out on the table. I'm here for my child. And this is not about um, blaming anyone or saying you're not doing your job, but rather for me as a parent to know that I'm going to try to get the best services for my child. And I think if you go into the conversation with a collaborative attitude, saying that I want to be a part of this team, um, I'm representing my child, and I've seen parents do this, I've been part of these teams, and it's so effective, where the parent comes in to the meeting, and a lot of times the people sitting around the table haven't even met this child. So the parent puts the child on the table, literally, you know, has a portfolio so that the child's, you know, full eight and a half by eleven picture of the child on the front of the on the front of the portfolio. In case you haven't met my child, this is Eric, um, and Eric is a great kid. Let me tell you a little bit about him, so that everyone kind of gets a feeling, a flavor of that child, and just tells a story, so that it puts the child front and center in the room. And then hopefully it takes the egos out of the equation um, so that when you're in a room, it's very intimidating. I have a, two children who've had difficulties learning and they're grown now, but I can remember even as, an, as a professional with a good bit of knowledge and understanding, feeling so intimidated by this group of people who had another agenda. It wasn't about necessarily my child. Um, so I wanted to just get it out there in a very positive um, way. And again, to say, you know, it's emotional for me. This is very emotional because this is about my child and I love my child more than anything in the world. So really trying to um, build a team uh, that's the other thing I would say to parents is build a team. Um, don't ever go into a situation where it could be contentious alone. You should always have somebody with you, whether it's your spouse, your sister, your brother, your best friend, whoever it may be that's going to give you strength. Because when you're in that moment, it's so emotional. And as much as you would hope that the people sitting around the table are there for your child. They're not always there for your child, sadly. They're there and somebody's told them, look, you're not giving in, we're not giving these services, whatever it may be. It's, it, it, it comes down to dollars and cents oftentimes. So when you're being, 
you know, when you get emotional and you're breaking down as your, as a parent because you, you feel so upset and you could be angry, you could be sad, you could be whatever the emotion is. You're not thinking straight. You need that other person that's going to sit by, by you and hold your hand or put their arm around you and give you strength so that you can be there um, shoring up the energy that and the and the wherewithal to to fight the fight, um, but always keeping it positive um, as much as you can, and as I think building that team is really important. Finding one person in the school who believes in your child and making sure that one person is always there. You know, you're bringing your resources from the outside, your advocates, but you need somebody on the inside. So if you can, and, and I told my children that too, like find it, find that person in the school. I don't care if it's the custodian, it's the secretary, it's the paraprofessional, whoever it may be, that's your go-to person. If you're, if you're feeling overwhelmed during the course of the day, you know that you can go see Mrs. Jones and she's going to give you a hug or whatever it may be. And then I would, I would say, Eventually, when you formed a relationship with her or him, they could come to the to the table as well in this process of getting the services for your child. Literacy is so important. I don't think you can function in this world without being, or at least not function well or easily without literacy. And while we have technology, that has helped the situation immensely. So you might not have to read a textbook necessarily. You can listen to a textbook. You can listen to a book on tape. So you can get it in other ways. But there's still times in life where you have to read things. And um, interesting, today we were at a conference and Philip Schultz, who's um, award-winning, actually Pulitzer Prize-winning poet, very dyslexic, was telling me that he gets really upset or nervous when he travels because he can't read the signs in airports very well. And he can't find his gate and he can't navigate. So what happens a lot of times for, for individuals with, with dyslexia is they may have learned to read well enough, but when they get in situations where um, there's a, it's a stressful situation, then they just like freeze. And so you gotta you gotta have literacy skills. Reading the medicine bottle, I mean, th there's just certain things that. How do you not have those those skills to to succeed? Um, even doing texting or emailing or communication, they're so critically important. And without it, I feel like we're not competing in the world. We're not competing in the global, you know, economy. Our stature as a nation has dropped over the years because literacy levels have not stayed um, current with other countries. So the implications of low literacy skills are just huge. Um, for our underprivileged children, it's staggering. It's estimated that 80 to 85 percent of children with color read below grade level. And if a child of color doesn't learn to read by third grade, there are states that actually determine the number of prison cells to build based on third grade literacy scores. So that basically means that you are going to be on the street. Um, and what does that cost the individual you know, emotionally um, and socially, and then what does it cost society? Mm -hmm.